board. Okay. Uh, so at this point, I think uh, all of you know that, that what we're going to do, I sent you all an email, all my students, uh, to try and just make sure you knew tonight's going to be extremely valuable for those of you who want not to waste time studying slides that aren't going to be on the exam or terms that are not going to be on the final either. We'll do that elimination process. That's the main task for two, tonight. But first we have a couple, I have a couple of, you know, announcements, updates, what have you uh, to tell you about. And uh, then we're gonna see 15 or 20, it's on the syllabus actually, but these are not must know. So that, that means we're not gonna, you know, do any analysis, but just quickly show you 15 cops, 20 minutes. My own slides of Notre Dame, which actually may be helpful because uh, that that is a, I didn't say it will be, but it's a high possibility that Notre Dame, the slide of it that was in the class lecture in Gothic architecture will be, one Gothic cathedral for sure will be on the final. So in any case, that will be something you'll have to take notes on and then that'll get us to around seven. We're gonna end extra early tonight and we don't need to take a break. And the main reason is just because you don't have any new must know slides to cover. The main topic is the review or discussion, I should say, is more of a discussion of the, of the uh, final, same exact format as the midterm. I'll explain that as uh, we, we go. Um, and the other reason is I'm guessing that there is at least a few Warriors fans here among this group. And if so, hang on, let me admit these two new people. Hi, we just, yeah, we're just now getting started. You didn't think. I'm saying we're going to end about 7.45 is the point. Uh, it shouldn't take that much uh, longer unless you, but I'm here for you guys with questions. And, and so it does, you know, mean that if you, you know, want to take more time, I'm here for that. And when we're done, as always, most of you can sign off if you've got all the information you want for the, the review that you should be studying. You know, I'm on for one week from tonight, the test, of course, will be given live and then recorded, of course, and posted on YouTube by uh, Thursday at 8, no, sorry, 5 p.m. Thursday of next week. That will allow you 48 hours to go back and check your answers, rewrite or revise any of them if you think it's necessary. And of course, uh, some people might not make it to the actual um, live session, then they have that as a backup. Um, okay, it's the same, exactly. The test is not harder or you know longer. It's uh, 100 points and it's three pages and you will get it sent to you uh, between four and 5 p.m. on the day of the test because you know, I would like to think that you're, you know, going to actually uh, do the true false questions in real time. But, you know, of course, you'll see what they are. But that's to give people time because you, you'll need to print it out. I, it's exactly what we did before the midterm and, and what my other class is already aware of. You need to print it out, I would suggest. However, if you have the ability to do the whole thing digitally, you're going to get it as a PDF. And if you can just do it all you know, online or, or, you know, uh, digitally and not have to take pen to paper, fine, more power to you, as long as you send it to me as a PDF when you're completed, when you've done all the answers the way you want them. The cutoff of that will be 5 p.m. on Saturday, exactly 40 or very close to 48 hours after you'll have it posted on YouTube. I can't extend that deadline because they moved, I think I mentioned this last week, uh, the, the administration for some reason moved up the deadline for all teachers to submit all grades by two or three days. It used to be the 6th or 7th of June for at least the last few years. Now it's the 4th, which leaves us really three days after Memorial Day weekend to get all the grades done. So I have to start correcting and sending to my readers for their corrections and you know, uh, adding up the scores and points for everybody uh, as soon as possible after the tests are submitted. So um, in other words, don't push it to Sunday. <laughs> uh, I have to have a cutoff. And if I don't observe that, I will get all the grades done for everyone who's turned theirs in on time. But it gives you plenty of time. It gives you the full hour of the test itself when we're doing it on you know, uh, Zoom next Wednesday, and then another 48 hours after that. Okay, anybody else that still needs to be admitted? Is that, yeah, there we go. Welcome. 
Okay, so I am going to uh, just show you what the test looks like. Well, you should remember from the, but it has been a few months, from the midterm, it's exactly the same format. I just printed it out. The one part I'm not going to show you, of course, is the true false questions, because those, I like to think of those as the ones that divide the A's from the B's, because there were 10 points total, two points each. And those are not, you know, just really easy, easy ones. But you have your notes. Remember, of course, this is really a much different form, uh, format for tests than any live in-person test, at least in the art history department and most other JCs, SRJC classes, I assume. Where the, well, I know some teachers gave open book tests too. I realize that when we were all, you know, in-person classes. Uh, but in any case, this is an uh, open book test by definition. So the uh, 10, you know, um, true false questions are worth two points each. Everything else exactly the same as it was before, where you can either write on this and then do a screenshot and, of course, convert that to a PDF and forward it to my AOL. You'll get a, another email reminding you of all this and then even another one right before the deadline as a final reminder. Um, okay, so, you, you know, you're identifying the slides. We'll give uh, everyone a little extra time to log in because I know some people can't get to their, you know, log in until after 6.30. So by 6.45, the first slide will be on the screen uh, and you have two minutes for each question uh, to identify. I'm sorry, I meant to say each, each slide identification. That's worth 45 points. That's nearly half the total. You don't want to be late for that if you want to take it in real time. And it gives you an advantage because then you've got you know, a, a extra time if you need to before you submit it to double check your answers. Uh, and and you can ask questions by um, chat during the test or right before it starts, of course, uh, in real time, you know, uh, verbally. All right, then there's the, the next section, same as, as the midterm, worth the same exact number of points, uh, 10 points for the five true false questions and then three slide analysis. And among those, uh, you know, you, you'll need to take up, well, you have up to 15 minutes in the real time, more if you do uh, the, the YouTube video to double check. And those uh, total 100, then there's an extra credit one, just like there was on the midterm of a real person, a slide I took, and it'll be in a place and, and a situation or a scenario that I will just tell you what that slide was, what was going on, and then you don't have to think too much to get five extra points. I recommend you do it, but you don't have to. If you don't want to, when you're done with the last of the three slide analysis, you can uh, log off, <clears throat> but that'll be worth five points. So altogether, the potential is for up to 105 points. And that has no bearing on the 50 point extra credit option, which no one in this class has yet gotten to that total. So that's another announcement. It's a really important one. And you'll get again, two more emails reminding you of this, one before the exam and one right, you know, the day of the deadline or day before, I'm sorry, that the cutoff for late papers is on uh, the day before the final. I can't be looking at and grading late papers when I'm grading finals. So it needs to be by um, midnight on Tuesday. The test is Wednesday. So if you haven't finished your second paper, you really want to get, get that done and get it in as soon as possible. Uh, and because I won't accept any late papers uh, after the test is, is, has been, you know, given in real time on Zoom. And then as far as extra credit, I've extended it. I used to make it also do before the final, but I'll extend that to uh, 5 p.m. On, on Friday, probably. I might even go ahead and make it Saturday. I'll send you an email. But that's also something you would rather, should, I mean, rather get done before you take the test. Because then you'll know how many points you can check with me. Remember, at any point, lo lots of people have, how many points do I have total? And what does that leave me? What grade am I, you know, at as of that moment? So you can always do that. I'm not going out of town on Memorial Day weekend. I can tell you how you're doing before the tests are graded or even before the test itself, of course, is given. Okay, uh, those are the main points I wanted to cover, um, but I think there were a couple people who, I just returned to late papers today. If you're one of those uh, two people, then you'll see it if you didn't already in your inbox. I was grading uh, those around four, 4.30 and, so does anybody have any questions now about any outstanding, you know, issues such as, you know, extra credit, late papers, 
for what we just covered with the overall uh, you know, format of the final. Any questions at all about any of the things we, we just uh, discussed? Anybody? Okay, you have another chance, of course, to do that when we actually do the, uh, I call it the reduction exercise where we cut down. I, and here's the promise. I put it in writing. So I uh, will always stick to it and you can hold me to it. Last night I exceeded that, that the figure. Um, this is uh, one forty percent of all the slides will be at least. It'll probably be more, maybe forty-five, of all the slides that are in the second half. Remember the finals, not cumulative, so you could ignore everything from before the midterm. And we'll do that together. And uh, before I move on to the other reduction exercise, which is doing the same thing, re reducing the number of terms to know. But that list is already so short. I only promise to do the, a third or more, maybe more, at least a third of the terms to know. And when we finish each of those two, you know, reduction exercises, uh, I will repeat the list slowly one time from start to finish week by week. So you all have the same exact information about what to study and what not. And that's when you can ask any questions if it's still not clear about that. And then that should should finish us up around, doesn't matter how it went last night, depending on how many questions you guys have, 7.45. And by that time, who knows what Curry will be doing. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be ahead of <coughs> LeBron James and points scoring. Uh, for those who care to, I'm recording it now. By the way, it's not likely, but if any of you are not focused totally on this when we do this, this review uh, process for the final, um, and you're looking at your phones, that's your business, obviously. Uh, just don't give away the score in any way, shape, or form, okay? Because I would like to watch it, you know, as much as possible. It's just not giving you enough half, half time by 7.45. Okay, before we start in on the slides of Notre Dame, which should be something that I hope will get those of you who have, and many of you have told me this, plans to travel in the future. It's going to be safe soon. It probably is by the summer to go to other parts of the world, especially Europe, which was the epicenter, remember, Italy? I know some students who were there on exchange, and they were so panicked. Uh, they, uh, I mean, they weren't, uh, one of them was a former student of mine, and the other uh, two were uh, siblings of my readers at that time. And one was in the part of Italy where the worst, you know, uh, of the pandemic first appeared in Europe. Yeah, and so they're obviously way better off. So this hopefully will inspire some of you if you haven't yet already had the chance to take, I hope, some of the information, not the facts, the details, but the ideas and the concept of the designs of these incredible uh, structures, Gothic cathedrals, they're a remarkable achievement, considering they were made, some of them, a thousand years ago, when the technology was obviously much more primitive, um, to go see them, and especially Notre Dame. It's, I think it's the most beautiful, well, let's just say Christian church in the world, or church, as opposed to, there are, of course, multiple beautiful sites in Islam, as I've shown you in some of my own slides, right? Uh, and Hinduism, and of course, uh, the, um, uh, what do I want to say? There's a group that's, now it's escaping me. Anyway, there's so many other wonderful sites around the world, and they don't have to have to do anything with the slides you saw in this class. But if you are in a place like Paris, and you go into Notre Dame, I think these slides will make a difference for your experience because it was my third visit and I hadn't decided it was worth the wait. And it could be an hour to get into the towers. That's what we're gonna see now and go up into either of the two towers. I think it's only one tower that's open uh, with a staircase. You, you gotta, there's no elevator. So, uh, well, maybe they have put one, but not that I've heard of, I doubt it. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so that is a, an issue, but you know, it was built 800 years ago. And if you can get to the top, the views you're gonna see are spectacular, both of the city below and of the gargoyles at eye level. That's what we're gonna look at for just the next uh, 15 or so minutes. Okay. So let's get this up on the screen and then get hide this, get this out of the way and maximize this. Okay, can you guys all see this? I hope, <laughs> right? It says screen sharing, so, I, well. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's always helpful to have just one person confirm. Well, you can already see that the gargoyles here are perched along the parapets, which line the towers 
200 feet above the streets of Paris because the two towers go 20 feet above that. I'm even going to show you what it looks like to look up, which is a little dizzying. If you, if you have a fear of heights, you probably shouldn't go up here. I have a moderate case of that, but you know, hey, it was born in the birthplace of skyscrapers. So I used to go up in the Sears Tower when I was younger. Uh, but those have glass cages. Every, every section of that building is encased in glass. Not here. You're kind of out in the open, but it's, it's worth it if you, if you aren't afraid of heights. So here's one of those gargoyles, and we're going to go up close to it, that originally was there when the building opened, which we know, if you remember your notes, was 12, right? 50 AD. So that's more like 770 years ago, almost 800. But as you might guess, they deteriorated with the air pollution. Paris is a metropolitan area of about 10 million. The city proper is about three. That, that very much tracks with Greater Chicago. It's about three million people in the city limits of Chicago and about 10 million in the metro area. So it's it's one of the, the things the UN defines as a megalopolis or a mega city. Any city with 10 million or more in its metro area. And so Paris is one of those cities. So of course you can imagine that the traffic, even though they have strict laws about air pollution, um, before those laws even, were did, just eating away the you know an acid rain was happening of course now that's pretty much a thing of the past at least in much of western europe it is so these are not the original gargoyles some of them are and i'll see if anyone can tell in a couple of views where you see both these are recast from the 1800s and this one of course is so french it almost seems like a cliche he's eating grapes <laughs> what is french famous for well a lot of stuff but one is their wine. It's still some of the best wine in the world, as much as I love California wine. Um, so this, they already had a, well, it wasn't an industry and they didn't export in the 1200s, of course, that early. But, uh, you know, there were people in France who were making wine, of course. And then this one here, it looks like he's licking his own chest, right? And that's an interesting one. But this one is my favorite. It's the devil that appears the devil gargoyle, I should say, or demon image as a gargoyle that appears at the end of the original film version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I know some of you saw, my daughter did when she was growing up as a kid, right? Uh, the Disney cartoon version. It's not bad. They got the architectural detail right on that. Uh, but uh, it's not the same as the first film version, which is 1939, right before World War II started, filmed. Uh, on location, but they didn't actually get to use the church, so they had to make a model of it, but it was very well done for that far back. And uh, this is that gargoyle from the side. And at the end of that movie, the original version is black and white uh, with Charles Lawton. Won, he won like three Academy Awards. The man was just one of the best actors of all time, certainly of the 20th century. He puts his arm, you know, as Quasimoto around the last scene in that movie, uh, the film version of the novel, around the shoulders or wing and shoulders of this gargoyle and says, why was I not made of stone as the, it's a pretty poignant uh, moment. Okay, and then these are our new ones. You can probably tell that, but because these were recast in concrete from molds and the originals are in museums. I'm not sure which museum, I think it's the Museum of Med Medieval Parisian Art that's called the Cluny. But anyway, you could look that up. The original gargoyles are on display somewhere in Paris, but there are still a few originals. There's the one that I was just talking about. And in case you're wondering what this is, we're going to take a quick look at it on the very last three or four slides. It's all that remains of another Gothic church across the river that uh, I'll explain why only the tower remains. And then this here should intrigue a few of you. What is that? Well, it's the high, only high point of land. Paris is pretty flat, except for this one hill. And that's where all the artists tended to go in the 1800s. And even now they often do to live because the rents were cheap then, now not today anymore. And that's about a 120 or 30 year old church built on the bones of the communist rebels, literally built over the graves of the Paris commune rebels who had taken over Paris and then were slaughtered after they were the city was recaptured by French um, military in the 1870s. So that church was begun literally to kind of make, try to make people forget that fact is how I look at it. Uh, in any case, it's a beautiful building, but it's way off there at the edge of the city, of course. Okay, this gargoyle is original, and you're going to see him with better light. Of course, depends on the time of day you're up there. Um, 
And we are not going to see this church. You might, a few of you, nobody asked, and I should apologize. I should have started with this. We had one more new slide to see, but I want to give you guys a break. We've seen enough Gothic architecture. So I'm going to be including in the reduction exercise, I will be cutting the San Chapelle, and that's it there. It is one of the most beautiful Gothic a small village. It's not a cathedral. It's a chapel, a small Gothic church. It has some of the most incredible stained glass windows of any church in the world. Uh, but I figured we'd seen enough of the other <clears throat> must knows in Gothic architecture. So we'll, we'll just eliminate that. Here we go. There. This gargoyle is original according to, well, and if it's not, it's a very early copy because it's, they spent de uh, decades restoring this church that is the uh, bishop, right, who runs the cathedral. Remember what a cathedral is. It's the largest and most important Christian church in a given city where a bishop presides. So the bishop who you know, presided over this, who restored it, was also trained as an architect. In this case, he was really an architect. And this is in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. So I think the evidence, I, as I recall, it's been, oh, wow, it was in the 90s or early no, late 80s, the last time I was up on the towers here. So anyway, the point is that this is, of course, look, he's eating. It looks like he's buying the head off of a rubber chicken or something. But the point is that that's probably an earlier I should have. There, there are some you can tell are absolutely original 750-year-old gargoyles. We'll, we'll see a couple of those in just the next few slides. Okay, but that one uh, is probably one of the early restorations because even into the last century, into the early 20th century, even possibly after World War II, there were still some of these gargoyles deteriorating that were replaced one by one. They weren't all replaced at once. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is an original one. That may be obvious because it's missing its face, right? In fact, half of its or part of its head. Uh, the elephant, it's harder to say, but an elephant is a gargoyle? My guess is that's when the French colonial empire started you know, expanding in Africa, right? Probably 200 years ago or so, maybe even less, maybe 150. But uh, th these that are more potmarked here and uh, worn down are original. You can see that one was, you know, another kind of demon. Remember what gargoyles are for. You'll have to know this is not on the exam, of course, but they were meant to scare away evil spirits uh, so that they wouldn't attack the church. Now here's looking up at the towers. And some of you may have heard this, that uh, some of the gargoyles at the tops of these cathedrals towers uh, were used uh, as a defensive mechanism. Well, as you may know, especially if you saw any version of the, you know, uh, story of uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, there was such a person, by the way, there really was, but I don't think his name was Quasimoto. And, Obviously, he didn't rescue a gypsy princess. Uh, th these uh, gargoyles uh, have rain spouts in them, and they connect to uh, a series of uh, troughs, which are on the top of each of the two towers. And yes, sometimes when the cathedral was attacked, and isn't the only church, it was many of the other cathedrals, not just in France, but in other parts of Europe did this, so occasionally people got upset, you know, for a variety of reasons, or just enemy invading armies, even with, you know, occupying a city. Uh, if they wanted to keep people away from, uh, bat, you know, battering in the doors with a battering ram, they would uh, literally fill those troughs, and then out uh, their mouths of these gargoyles would spew hot liquid, boiling oil, uh, you know, or even fiery, right, uh, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> And, and of course, just hot water, boiling water. So oil, water, and other uh, liquids, very, very hot heated liquids could come spewing out of there with really little or no warning. And of course, if you were standing down below there, you weren't going to walk away. <laughs> and you might, if you saw it coming, or the people in the next people behind the front row trying to break in, would of course be deterred from continuing their assault. And then these, I'm going to get uh, in trouble if I say exactly what I think they are and what some of the other tour guides uh, that I've asked about. I have friends in France I've talked to. They think that they are symbolic of a certain male reproductive, <laughs> but I don't know if that's true. It does have that uh, consideration as a possibility. Why? Because the church was kind of trying to encourage uh, after the Black Death, the bubonic plague, right? And so a third of all of Europe passed away, talk about a really bad, right, uh, plague that killed the worst, 
I think, result of any plague in the history of at least the Western world. A third of the population died, and that was in the 1300s. They may have then tried to encourage with some symbolic gestures there, um, you know, fertility, human, you know, reproduction, so that the population re 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 uh, recovered from the plague. Now, here in this view, um, you see the largest bell ever cast. This is way bigger than, say, the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia or any of the other church bells anywhere else in uh, any part of the world that has bell towers. This is the one Quasimoto, and again, the film versions, and I can't remember if it's in the novel, I read it back in high school, jumps on and keeps swinging, you know, with the weight of his body back and forth until this clapper uh, finally hits this. And let me tell you, if you're up there, Unless you've been like I have in the front row of a Rolling Stones concert, which wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I couldn't hear for two or three days after that. Uh, you should bring something, to, uh, earplugs, and, and then still cover your ears on top of that because the sound is deafening. It's one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard. I think they warn you that before you go in the tower and before they ring this bell. But guess what? It takes five minutes because I didn't have enough you know, space in the frame of the photo to take, but there's a rope at the bottom of this, which is tied to the railing where people are leaning. They're leaning on a railing. And yes, it does look straight down. So you gotta be careful there. There's another 200 foot drop within the tower, right? So when you're standing there looking at this, you can um, you can wait if you want. And I did, I decided let's, let's see what it's like for the current bell ringer or tour guide. I don't know if he was a bell ringer to pull the rope. And it it's so heavy that it takes like three or four minutes to get this uh, you know, clapper to hit the end of the bell. It's that heavy and that uh, you know, immobile uh, or nearly immobile. So it's, a, you know, it's a part of the tour if you choose to stay. But they tell you, if you, if you have sensitive hearing or, or hearing loss, you shouldn't stay. Okay, the last several slides we're gonna see now are of the city. And this is the, uh, what they call the left bank. Some of you heard that phrase or Latin quarter, the two terms are synonymous because this is where all these students lived and studied and the professors in the middle ages and well into the uh, Renaissance. And the buildings are mostly, this is the oldest section of Paris physically. The city goes back to Roman times. The Romans founded it 2000 plus years ago. But physically the city is, parts of it are medieval. So some of these streets have medieval buildings. Uh, this isn't, this is probably obviously a late Renaissance uh, building, and it's their national shrine to all their uh, most famous writers, artists, and political leaders, and their, um, their sarcophagi, right, of the most famous, like Voltaire is in there, and some of the other leaders of the French Revolution uh, are buried inside there. So it's a national historic site, and it was built in the early 70s, like 300 years ago. But that's one of the newer buildings in this section. These buildings here are 500, 600 years old, some of them 700. And there still is a university community, but then there's also a lot more new, you know, new meaning re remodeled interiors, which are either owned by or rented to, um, you know, tourists by the week or month. Uh, I've stayed in a couple of them, or people have bought them, of course, for their families to live in. Here's what I was saying earlier about the um, spigots or, you know, um, rain spouts, I should say, spouts, uh, that could be used to defend the church. That's the bishop's house. The bishop of Paris, I don't think, lives there much anymore, but he does. It's his, still his official residence, but it's, you know, kind of noisy right in the middle with all the tourists and, you know, in the middle of the river and, you know, all, all the crowded, uh, you know, events happening and noisy traffic going by. So I think he has a second residence somewhere else, but that is officially the original house built for the bishop who presided over this church right next to where he lived. And then here's the spire. We saw it earlier, I think it was two weeks ago when we covered uh, the must know slides of Gothic architecture. Uh, and then this angel is an original one. That angel is from about uh, the same age as the church. But the spire is much later and it's the one that melted, totally melted uh, in a pool of lead. <laughs> Toxic fumes came out of it. In fact, the, the people were told that they should check with their doctors if they live within a few blocks of the church during that fire in 2019, wasn't it? Yeah. And then here's your cross shape where you have the arms of the cross. That's the nave, the longest section, right, of, the, of any uh, Christian church, the main central aisle, and then the two arms of the transept. 
Uh, but what I really want to capture, there's another island, by the way, that's where the richest of the you know people that run their own fashion houses will be done in about three or four minutes here. And we'll get started with the view. Uh, and the president of France usually has an apartment there. It's, it's an exclusive island. Now, you're allowed to walk around, but uh, I don't think there's much to see there except the, uh, these five, three, four, five hundred year old uh, five story apartment buildings. But here's the flying buttresses. And I'll give it up and you can see that there's a trough in there too for so you have multiple levels of defensive mechanisms on these churches at least some of them certainly Notre Dame was attacked multiple times by peasants who were upset with the well let's just say inequity inequality obviously drastically so in the, in the middle ages and well through the renaissance of course right up until the 1800s, there wasn't really much equality in, in French economy or, or culture. So a lot of times there were angry mobs that would attack the church and none of them broke in that I know of. And I'm not sure exactly if every time that happened, those mobs were dissuaded by these gargoyles spewing hot liquid, but at least in the earlier times, that's definitely what, what happened. Okay, and then here we have another view of those classic French Parisian um, uh, that's the University of Paris, by the way, the Sorbonne, it's called. Uh, and then we have what would, would, of course, be, you know, the center of Paris. Look, no skyscrapers. No, they don't allow skyscrapers in the city limits. I think that's why. See, there they are, all on the outskirts in the suburbs. Uh, that's a city, if not national, uh, zoning law. Okay, so we're going to, there's the tallest tower in France. I think it still is. It's about the height of the Pan America, I'm sorry, the Bank of America building in downtown San Francisco, about 800, a little over, maybe 850 feet. But of course, that's the tallest structure in France, the Eiffel Tower. And you can see you're on an island in the middle of the river. This island is where the Romans founded Paris when it was a Roman outpost. Okay, and then we have these gargoyles. Now let's just end up with this tower. It's called the Tour Saint Jacques, and it is a uh, particularly uh, evocative monument because this one was attacked and destroyed by an angry mob during the French Revolution, the church around it. But the tower, the priests retreated into the tower and they had enough food to last for, I don't know, a week or so. Plus they were able to use, you know, these gargoyles again to spew hot liquid on the <laughs> attacking mob below. And so it ended up being um, just the tower survived uh, because Finally, the crowd, crowd, I'm sorry, the mob, the crowd, the, the mob attacked when, you know, they ran out of boiling liquid or whatever and were starving to death. The crowd awaited them out. They stormed up the stairs of the tower and threw the priests off the tower to their death. But the tower survived because the rest of the building had been burned down, but the tower was uh, too, too sturdy, made out of stone, of course. I think that's it. All right, so let's now stop share and we'll shift to the review for the test. Okay, I hope you found that at least mildly interesting. Um, all right, so remember how we're gonna do this. So you wanna do this now as we do together. I would certainly suggest about the only way to do it uh, uh, thoroughly and accurately is to have a pen in your hand and go week by week, which is how I'm gonna do it. And we're going to get to 40% or more. So how do we do that? It's pretty straightforward. We are going to do a count. Now, if you want to count with me, great. Anybody have a calculator? I, I always forget to bring it to my uh, laptop because there's so much else going on right before class, uh, such as making up the final so that I make sure that if I cut something, it's not going to still appear on the final. That wouldn't be fair to anybody, right? So here we go. You want to count with me? I'm going to count silently. Uh, you can. Uh, and then the 40% calculation, that I can do in my head probably or on paper. And so we'll at least reduce it by 40%. Okay, so the total number of slides starting with week eight. Here we go. One. Sixty-nine. Let's call it seventy, because to get to forty percent, 
uh, that would be pretty easy, right? Some of you probably already done that if you had a calculator or you're good at doing simple math in your head, it would be 28. I'm sort of going to cut more than that. Um, let's see if we we'll cut at least 30. And here's what we'll do. We'll cut about that many, you know, proportionately from each week as we go. Then we'll stop at the end. We'll, we'll stop and recount how many did I cut? And if we're short or, you know, it's, it's, you know, something I can maybe even round up, I won't, you know, uh, just stick to that. Let's say at least 30. Okay. Uh, and maybe more that you don't have to study. Remember that's the, the point of this, uh, process. Okay, so let's everybody look at week eight. All right, I'm going to get my clipboard here. Sorry, it's not nearby. Okay, so follow along with me here. We're going to take from week eight, because that was when the midterm was. The second half, though, was the new slides, right? Uh, San Vitale from Ravenna. That's the third one down. Cross that out. Uh, icon of Virgin and Child from Istanbul. And as much as I like St. Basil's, I've been there multiple times. And, you know, my daughter's heritage is from Russia. I, I think it's, you know, I don't think we covered it in this context. I think we covered it later. So go ahead and cross out St. Basil's. Now that's well over 40% of the total of this week, week eight, okay? Uh, and I'll repeat these all in one long, slow recount or recap at the end. But for now, I'm recapping each week before we move on to the next one. So you can double check that you've got them correctly uh, marked. Cross out San Vitale from Ravenna, Icon of Virgin and Child from Istanbul, and St. Basil's Cathedral, okay, from Moscow. Moving on to week nine. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The Great Mosque at Isfahan. Cross that out. Um, the Mosque of Sultan Suleiman from Turkey. And at the moment, I'm going to leave the others because they're different enough from each other. And the Taj Mahal is technically later than this uh, period that we're supposed to cover in this class, but it ties in architecturally and stylistically with the earlier works. So, so that one I'm going to tell you now has a high possibility of being on either the slide ID part or the slide essay part of the uh, final. Again, so for now we're just cutting two. We may have to cut one more uh, when we do the recap. Okay, week nine, there were two. We cut Great Mosque of Isfahan and Mosque of Sultan Selim from Turkey. Okay, moving on to week 10. Uh, uh, we're going to cut Eternal Shiva from the Cave Temple in India. Uh, and we're going to cut uh, Reclining Buddha from Sri Lanka. Um, and then let's see. I think we'll cut Descent of the Ganges because you can't see the whole thing up close in the, in the slide I was able to get. Um, okay, so again, that's three from week 10. Uh, just to repeat, it's the Eternal Shiva from Cave Temple, India, Declining Buddha from Sri Lanka, and Descent of the Ganges from India. Okay, moving on to week 11. We never did cover Shang Dang, Finga Ding Dang, Ring a Ding Do, whatever the, the one that always reminds me of a, a, a line from uh, Frank Sinatra. Okay, second slide, we didn't cover it, and that's the, I say it slowly, Shang Dynasty Fang Ding, in case you weren't here that week. Cross that out. Okay, um, and then I don't think we actually covered the, well, we did cover the pagoda, but it was a different structure and that could confuse people, obviously. So cross off uh, Fo Guang Si Pagoda, second from the bottom under week 11. All right, moving on. We're going now to, um, let's see. We need to cut night, uh, uh, sorry, monk sewing. Uh, cow Ninja, cross that out. Um, Buddhist Temple at Nara. We want to keep one of those two, but not both of them. So I'm going to cross out Biodo Inn because it has two possible names and uh, it's very similar to the Temple at Nara. So we'll keep the Temple at Nara and cross off Phoenix Hall, Biodo Inn. I'm going to keep the others for now. Let, we'll see where we're at when we get done. Okay, moving on then to 
the second half of week 12, next page. Okay. Um, we're going to keep the first two, but Temple of the Giant Jaguar from Tikal, Guadalama, uh, Guatemala, I'm sorry. That's the third one down. Cross that out. Okay. And the fresco of a Mayan priest was not exactly, you know, the, the one I had thought it would be. So cross that out. That's the fifth one down. We'll leave the two. Uh, so we only have two on Africa. We'll leave both of those. Um, Templo Mayor, it's an important site. I'm not saying it's not. In fact, it's fascinating. But, but there isn't a lot of detail you can see because they're still excavating it, right, as you might recall. Uh, so we have to cut something. So um, I think we'll do that. Templo Mayor from Mexico City. So that's three we're cutting from week 12. Temple of the Giant Jaguar from Guatemala, Fresco of a Mayan Priest from Mexico, and Templo Mayor from Mexico City. Okay, moving on to week 13. Stag Staff from Sutton, who crossed that off. Okay. Um, Let's see. West work from Santa Panta Leon, Germany. Cross that off. Um, for now, we'll leave the others. Yeah. Okay, Romanesque art. <clears throat> um, Prophet Jeremiah from the Church of Saint Pierre. Cross that out. Uh, and let's see. Hmm, this is a harder one to do than I thought it would be. Um, well, let's do more on the second half then. Uh, Church of Saint Denis, let's leave that one, okay. Uh, Nave of Shark Cathedral, we'll cross that out. Nave of Shark Cathedral, this is on week 14 now. Um, Saint Chapelle, obviously. And I'm going to go ahead and cut the rose window, even though we covered it in some detail. The rose window of Notre Dame. So that's three, the nave of Chartres Cathedral, Saint-Chapelle in Paris, and the rose window in Notre Dame. Uh, okay, the next two, let's see. Wait, which, the Saint-Chapelle, which week is that in? That's uh, near the bottom of week 14, but I'm glad you, you, you interrupted my forward motion here because I actually should cut one of the two cathedrals that looks I'm giving you guys, I hope, a significant break here, very much similar to the other one. And uh, so it could be easy to confuse them. So Reims Cathedral, cross that out. Okay, even though I, it's a wonderful structure. So now that's well over 40% for week 14. Okay, so I'll repeat that. Week 14, we cut four. Nave of Chartres Cathedral, France. Reims Cathedral, France. Saint Chapelle from Paris and the Rose Window of Notre Dame. Okay, moving on. I think the Cologne and Salisbury Cathedral are different enough from each other that you should be able to tell them apart. They don't, they don't look the same as, as Notre Dame, but, except for the Gothic pointed arches, of course. Okay, let's move on. A virgin and child enthroned on the last page now we are for, for week 15. Um, and then I'm gonna cross off the Parson Capen House. Oh, I meant, to, I was trying to remember a movie. I know this is a quick aside, but there are some of you who might find this interesting enough. It's a movie with Daniel Day-Lewis and Winona Ryder, and they both were nominated rightfully for Academy Awards. It's called The Crucible. It's the Ar Arthur Miller play. And they recreate Ma uh, Salem, Massachusetts during the witch trials. It's so authentic that the architectural historians by themselves would watch it just for that reason. Now, obviously I'm one of those. But the story is compelling. It's, 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 it's of course, a fictional account of what it would have been like to live there when these, you know, sort of overwrought teenagers ended up accusing the whole village practically of being in league with the devil and putting spells on them and how many people died, 20 people because of that. And well, Danny Day Lewis alone <laughs> makes that movie worth watching. So it's called The Crucible, if you're curious. Okay, uh, let's cross one of the others. Let's see, February from the Book of Hours, okay. All right, so we're going to leave. Now, now I'll repeat that list and then let's do the whole thing since we just got joined by or rejoined by someone and that'll be a valuable thing for everyone who's attending tonight uh, to make sure we have a minimum of 30, I promise you that. Okay, but last week is week 15 that we cut now three from that 
Virgin and Child in Throne, by Jim Abue, February from the Book of Hours, Lindbergh Brothers and Parson Cape in House, Massachusetts. So let us do the count. Some of you have probably already done that. Did we get to 30? I think we got close, but uh, we might not yet quite be there. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, we got to cut five more. Okay, so let's go to uh, one of my favorite uh, topics to 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 uh, cut. <laughs> Early medieval art. Okay, we're going to cut um, the cross page from the Linda's Farm Gossip. Okay, that gets us to twenty six. If you're following along, right? And then I'll repeat the whole thing once before we move on. We need to cut at least one more from the Romanesque art slide uh, section. So. Um, hmm, we need the nave, we need at least one cathedral nave. Uh, so, uh, much as I hate to do it, we're gonna cut the mission of the apostles from Vézelay because it is a long title to remember. Okay, so that gets us to 27. So we still got three more to cut. All right, on week 15, we'll cut one of these two cathedrals. Um, Hmm. Give me a second, because I told you a lot of facts about both, and they don't look alike, but I'm trying to pick the one that's the most complicated for you guys to remember. Um, well, cut Cologne Cathedral as much as I hate to do that. The picture is, is not exactly an accurate color image of that. So we'll leave Salisbury Cathedral. So now that gets us up to... So we need to get at least two more. Um, let's go back to the beginning and then I think we can wrap it up here and then move on to reducing the uh, terms in O and then I'll just stick around for any questions you might still have. Okay, um, night attack at San Joe Palace. Okay, I'm sorry, let's stay the week, week 11, sorry, under week 11, night attack at San Joe Palace. You can cross that off. So we need to cut one more. I don't see that on our list. Uh, yeah, it's at the uh, it's the second from the bottom under Japanese art before 1400. Yeah, that's what we're here for. So I just want to make sure before you proceed. Can you see that? It's the bottom we already cut was monk sewing. It's one. I, I was reading the second half as a different week. I got it. Yeah, it's week 11. It is. It is the second half, Japanese art before 1400. Yeah, it's, it's you know, an interesting image, but there's not a lot of meaning to it. It's a warlord attacking another warlord's compound, right? Okay, let's see, we got to cut one more then. Um, hmm. Okay. I'm not gonna cut Dome of the Rock and it still bothers me. I'm still seeing in the media, both print media and broadcast media, or cable, whatever, that they're still saying that the, that this whole series of t terrifically tragic events, of course, that are going on in uh, Israel and the G Gaza Strip, started with uh, a controversy in front of the um, <clears throat> Dome of the Rock. It may well have, but they keep showing the wrong building, if that's what the case was. Both buildings are restricted. That's part of the meaning. You should have that in your notes. Uh, they were for, for decades when Israel conquered that area, the West Bank. They took over those two, uh, the two oldest mosques in the world. And the one we saw was the third oldest. The second oldest one is the Alaska Mosque. It's a separate structure, so don't confuse the two. In case you're seeing the news and you start thinking, oh, maybe Mr. Wilson got it wrong. Uh, no, it's just not identified correctly because they show images. Maybe the, the reporters know better, but whoever's taking the photos or film isn't clear on which building they're talking about. Okay, let's see. Um, hmm. Okay, I know, I hate to do this. Yeah, week 11, Song Dynasty Guan Wei Vase. We'll cut that because there isn't a lot to say about it. Okay, let's do this quickly and then get to the review, uh, to the same process. I won't take us anywhere near as long of terms uh, to reduce that list of terms to know. So here we are week by week. Follow me just to make sure you have, all of you have it correct. Week eight. We're cutting three, San Vitale from Ravenna, Icon of Virgin and Child from Istanbul and St. Basil's Cathedral, Moscow. Week nine, we're cutting uh, two, 
great mosque at Isfahan from Iran and mosque of Sultan Salim from, Salim from Turkey. Just in case, when I leave more than, you know, uh, three or four, if I leave the majority in a topic, in other words, with Islamic art, I can tell you right now, at least one of those will be on the final. It's an important topic. Of course, it often gets overlooked. All right, moving on to week 10. We're cutting three more. Eternal Shiva from Cave Temple. Uh, reclining Buddha from Sri Lanka and descent of the Ganges from India. Okay, week 11, the first half, we're cutting three. Shang Dynasty Fang Ding, uh, Fo Guan Si Pagoda, and Song Dynasty Guan Wei Base. Second half, we're cutting three more. Biodo or Phoenix Inn, Night Attack on Sanjo Palace, and Monk Sewing by Cow Ninja. It's of course from Japan. All right, and then the second half of that, we're cutting three more. Temple of the Giant Jaguar from Guatemala, Fresco of a Mayan High Priest from Mexico, and Temple Mayor from Mexico City. Week 13, we're cutting uh, three. Stag Staff from Sutton Who, Cross Page from Linda's Farm Gospel, and West Work of San Pantaleon in Germany. Second half, we're cutting two. Mission, the two, two sculptures, right? Mission of the Apostles from Vesele and Prophet Jeremiah from the Church of Saint Pierre. Week 14, we're cutting four. Nave of Chart Cathedral, Reims Cathedral, Saint Chapelle, and the Rose Window at Notre Dame. Week 15, we're cutting four more. A Cologne Cathedral from Germany, Virgin and Child Enthroned, uh, Jim Mabue, February from the Book of Hours, Lindbergh Brothers, and the Parson Cape and House, House in Massachusetts. Okay, that's that's well over 40%. It's about, about 45. Okay, shifting gears. We can do this fairly quickly. Uh, the term list of terms to know, again, I promise you at least a third, because this is a much shorter list, uh, which it won't leave you that many to study, but a third of the total, we have to do the same thing, a quick count of what terms there are. Icon was from before the midterm, so it starts where you see, I hope you're following me along, I think it's the second page, maybe the third page, yeah, the third page. Uh, they're not numbered, but you can see that. Three main features of Greek Orthodox churches, right? We're going to start with that, but let's see how many are there from that to the, there to the end, and then I'll uh, reduce the total uh, number accordingly, okay? Twenty-four, so that would be eight we need to cut. And uh, I will tell you when we go, let's start with this one. We're going to keep the Greek three main features of Greek Orthodox churches. But when there's a list like that, or the things invented by Muslims, you, you, they're not separate definitions. That would be piling on too much, uh, at least in my mind. Uh, so it's just, I might, in other words, it's the way I did with one or two lists, like the Romans. Remember that? And some of you uh, noticed that. It was a slightly trick question when I said three things embedded by the Romans. Uh, if it's a list like this, and it, it will, if it appears on the final, it would be on the true-false section and might say that things invented by the Muslims included, you know, A, B, C. And if any one of them is not correct, then that's false. That's how it would appear, not with definitions of each of those five things. So let's go back again to the, I'm sorry, bottom of page three. Don't cross out the three main features of Greek Orthodox churches. Cross out apps at the top of the next page, everybody, apps. Okay, uh, and then um, stupa, S-T-U-P-A, you can cross that out, stupa. Okay, pagoda, cross that out. Um, and since we did not have a slide of the Mayan priest doing the bloodletting ritual that was clear. We're going to cross that out on the next page. So we did pagoda on page four now at the top and go down two more and cross out Mayan bloodletting ritual. Okay, uh, animal style, medieval. Well, hmm, let me hold off on that one. Okay, the next two you can cross off illuminated manuscript and staff. The reason I'm hesitating is I'm leaving the purse cover from Sutton Hoo which has a high possibility, I would say probably, but decent chance of being on the final. Um, and that is a medieval animal style work. So I'll leave that for now. Okay, so again, on this page, well, we'll repeat the whole list. Illuminated manuscript and staff, you should cut those. Two, three, four, how many have we cut now? 
Um, whoops. Five, six. We only need to cut two more. We'll be cut more than that. I'll make it a nice round 10. Okay. Cupola, cross that off. I'm going to leave the list of terms Gothic. That's a high possibility appearing on the two false section. And then I'm going to cut, um, let's see, flamboyant style because we just cut, uh, sorry, Reams, which is that example. Uh, and um, let's see. I'm going to cut decorated style in the wait, wait, is that eight? Oh, I said I'd make it 10. Yes, decorated style. Because the slide, the only slide we have of that example of that is uh, Salisbury, which I didn't cut off the list, but there's enough other facts about that for you to, you know, if you study properly and or see your notes, if it's on the uh, final, to, to come up with six facts without necessarily describing the, the, the term decorated style. So that gives us what we have to cut one more and then we'll be done. One, two, three. I think that's right. I said four or five. Except Cutting flamboyant style, did you say yes on that? Eight, nine. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, say again. Did, did you say you're cutting flamboyant style? Uh, yes, and I'm going to repeat the list as I did before. Um, and then I think I should leave international style because it relates to the only painting. This is the only painting we have but that's not a fresco. And that's the one by, um, again, tip to the wise that that is a high possibility of being on one of the two sections of the final, the Lamentation by Giotto. That is an example of international style. I'm going to cut perpendicular style. Because again, there's enough information I gave you about the chapel of Henry VII, which is the only example of perpendicular style we have. Uh, that that you can and you can even mention Tom Hanks went in the building as if I, I accept that as one of your six facts about the meaning to film a scene from um, the Da Vinci Code. So you know shows how important that site is if Tom Hanks wanted <laughs> was asked to do a scene in there. I'm being silly, of course, but the point is you got plenty of facts about the meaning. Oh, let's do that and then we're done. Except for any questions you have. One last time, let's recap that we have ten cut from the second half of the terms to know. So go to uh, page four, I think it is, yes. Apps, that's one, stupa, two, right? Everybody's following. On the next page, pagoda, number three, Mayan bloodletting ritual, number four, illuminated manuscript, number five, staff, number six, uh, cupola, number seven, flamboyant style, number eight, decorated style is nine, and perpendicular style is 10. So I've cut more than a third, probably about 40% from that list too. So we finished our exercise uh, in reduction, but I'm sticking around for anybody that has questions uh, about anything relating to the exam that I didn't cover, or if you joined us late, a couple people did. Remember that this is uh, going to be in real time at 6.45 on uh, one week from tonight. And then it's a one hour test and I'll stick around afterwards for, for people with questions, but I'm then going to post it, wait until Thursday at 5 p.m. to post both tests for both classes. That way it's only you know, fair to every student in each of my classes has exactly the same number of hours to review or rewrite their tests. And that means both uh, of those will be posted by 5 p.m. on the Thursday after our exam the next day for 48 hours. And the cutoff, it won't be on there anymore. And for uh, it's going to be 5 p.m. on YouTube on Saturday, all of which I sent you an email. I'll repeat that twice before the actual deadline. And then one more time, the deadline for extra credit, uh, which no one has come close to 50 points. So you might want to pad your, you know, margin for error. Um, and that will be probably midnight on Friday. I think that's reasonable because then I've got a segue into grading the test uh, because I assume some of you will want to get the test out of your way before the weekend. And so I can actually start grading those if you turn them in before Friday. Um, in any case, all late papers are due if they're already still out there uh, by midnight on the day before the final for both classes. So for us, that means, for you guys, that means by midnight on Tuesday, I need any late papers that you might still have not submitted. 
Oh, okay. I think we covered just about everything uh, that I uh, intended to, but I'm, as always, available because these are my informal office hours for anybody who has questions. Anybody have any questions about anything we covered tonight? If you want to know your total grade points, you should email me, of course, so it doesn't become public knowledge. Anybody else have any other questions at all that we didn't cover that they need to have answered at this moment in time? Okay. Well, let's go see how the those of us who care to watch it, how the Warriors are doing, or else just relax, and I'll see you all one week from tonight. Don't forget, though, you want to log on as early as you can after 6.30, uh, or by 6.30 if you can, because I will be on for all of those 15 minutes to answer your questions up until the first slide, of course. All right, uh, I will see you all next week. Is that it? Last call. Anybody have any other questions? Would you guys thank have you. a good week? Good luck. Yeah, thank you all for your participation all semester. I've really enjoyed teaching this class. And I will have an announcement at the end of the class that will have a benefit to one or two people. I need a new reader, an extra reader. I mean, I'm gonna be teaching an extra class next semester, but I'll remind you of that by, you know, quickly before the test and afterwards. We'll talk about that after we get uh, logged on next week, one week from tonight. See you all then, 6.30, or so as close as you can uh, on Wednesday. All right, good luck with all your other finals. Okay, good night. <laughs>